Broadcasting live from the Business Radio X studios in Phoenix, Arizona, it's time for Phoenix Business Radio, spotlighting the city's best businesses and the people who lead them. Hello and welcome to Phoenix Business Radio, broadcasting live from the Max 6 Entrepreneurial Center right here in Tempe, Arizona, where we help build businesses and connect you with the right people. And today I am very excited about my conversation with part of the leadership team at ProGuard Security Services. Welcome to the studio, gentlemen. Thank, Thank you. you so much. So happy to have you here on this beautiful, hot and sunny day. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, we have JJ and Nils who are representing ProGuard today and welcome to the Arizona market. I know that's a fairly new decision for you. It's fairly new, and thank you for having us on this show, and thank you for all the listeners that you have to um, tune in to your broadcast. Uh, yeah, we are fairly new to uh, the Phoenix area. We've been operating here almost a year now, um, give or take, and we're making some good inroads, and we're here to help um, Phoenix and the greater Phoenix area really have options when it comes down to picking a great security company. That's Pro what we do. Protecting us and the things that matter, right? Right. So why Arizona? Why did you think it was time to come here and, and be part of our community? Yeah, we um, obviously, you know, my role as the chief revenue officer is to, um, you know, uh, be responsible for top line growth of our company. And that entails um, expansion into other markets, um, you know, diversifying our service deliverables so that we can um, have different streams of revenue. So Arizona was a, um, an original or a, a natural um, expansion for us because I'm a resident of Arizona. Yeah, yeah. So um, when I moved out here several years ago, it was kind of two-pronged. It was one that I was moving out here, but also to um, set up shop out here as well and continue to grow our brand out here. And just to comment off of Niels's comment, we are also down in Tucson as well, uh, operating down there as well. So we're trying to cover the entire state of Arizona at this point. What the company does, what we're really looking into growing, when, we, when we're looking at new markets, the company had grown out of San Francisco, the Bay Area. We moved into different lo uh, local markets, I should call them, um, San Jose, East Bay, Oakland, that area, and they kind of grow out, out of um, San Francisco. When, we are, when we're looking to enter into a new market, we're li really looking to seek us to establish ourselves into tier one markets. Phoenix is definitely one of tier one market. There is a lot of activity going on in Phoenix. A lot of companies are establishing themselves here. Uh, the market is growing. Um, there's just a lot of opportunities here. So we want to be part of that. We want to be part of the community, building a solid foundation, providing a really good quality security service uh, for our clients um, and protecting and working with their assets. So let's talk about that. Uh, for our listeners and viewers who may not be familiar with who you are, what services do you offer? Tell us a little bit about the industry and, and your role in it. Sure. Starting with the basics, I guess, security industry. Um, I get the question a lot of times, oh, what type of security? I mean, it's not obvious. Is it internet? Is it online? Is it offline? We provide a physical uh, security service, meaning that we provide uh, trained staffing, trained security officers that will provide a tailored security solution for your for our customers' needs. Um, so it's not high tech. We do deploy technology into the way that we operate. We do deploy technology to help us achieve our goals of 100% accuracy in the service delivery. Uh, but it's really that is the industry that we are playing in. So, what would you add to that? Yes. Yeah, so, um, you know, in addition to that, we do provide other types of security solutions as well. We do security patrols, you know, having our uh, field supervisors, patrol drivers going to accounts and just checking on the, on the accounts, making sure that the building is secure and safe and reporting on that and leaving and going somewhere else. Um, that is one of our um, service deliveries as well. And then kind of you talked about the industry and where it's going, um, you know, the commercial real estate industry has been, you know, um, has taken a hit ever since COVID. And um, we're finding a lot of clients are um, still not having the tenancy that they, they want to have, that they would like to have in terms of supporting their buildings, supporting their, the owners of those buildings and having revenue. So we think it's responsible. It should be part of our existence to identify that with our clients and provide other security solutions for them that may come at a cost savings for them. So one of those things is uh, remote monitoring. So we are kind of getting into the technological side of it. Um, you know, we have a security operations center that can look at cameras, can take in feeds. Um, and, you know, we have uh, AI analytics layered on top of that. So it makes it much easier for our security, op um, security operations center 
monitors to weed out the false alarms and things like that. Right. So then that comes to at a cost savings. It's like right. almost like maybe a fifth of the price of having an actual person on site, you know, for an entire shift for seven days a week. So we're we're uh, fully aware of you know the <clears throat> different. Um, artificial intelligence tools and, and the trends in the market, we are positioning ourselves to, to really take full advantage of any kind of AI uh, technology that can help us either enhance our services or even um, cut costs in terms of the service delivery. And as, as JJ mentioned, we recently built out, well, not recently, but we built out a um, very sophisticated, very uh, advanced uh, SOC, a, a security um, c- control center uh, where we monitor remotely our clients' assets and where we can really respond rapidly with with uh, uh, security services to those locations if there would be something coming up that is of an intrusion or some kind of alarm being set off. So the, the market is going <clears throat> toward um, more automation and more of a- AI technology being implemented. And this is our focus and our uh, effort to really help our clients to, as JJ said, bringing down the cost and and giving a really good security solution. Um, but yeah, as a base service, it's still security officers providing a service at the different locations that we service. And from a from an industry standpoint, uh, the commercial, the, I just read an article the other day, it stated that they will take 20 years for San Francisco to rebound in the commercial market. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's a pretty dire prediction. We will see. I mean, the jury's still out. Uh, that was one article. Uh, but we, as, as JJ said, we really want to work with our clients to make sure that they get a really good service um, at a cost that they can afford with the, in a lot of cases, much smaller footprint in terms of the their leased space. There's a lot of vacancy that really needs to be filled up again before they are really operating at full capacity. Mm-hmm. Why is this? Yeah, yeah, that absolutely. Robot, so, and the one thing that we um, can provide as well is re- a, a response mechanism. You know, law enforcement continues to get more and more busy, you know, and they're trying to do more with less. And, um, mm-hmm. you know, if you have a client who um, we're monitoring, you know, their cameras, their access control system, and we have a glass break or we have some sort of a vandalism happening, that may not solicit a, a law enforcement response. They may say no. So we're able to actually send, you know, a, a patrol officer, security um, patrol officer, to the site to assess what's going on, contact a client, and kind of work on a solution uh, when maybe law enforcement can't do that. And more and more that's happening where those resources are less and less in communities, which is why we rely on companies like yours. Right. Thank you for adding that. Nils, how did you get involved in this industry? I know, JJ, when we've talked, you have mentioned that you've kind of been swimming in this pond for a while, which is why Nils has brought you on board. How about you? How did you get started in security? Yeah, that's a, a little bit of a longer story, actually, but I'll try to keep it fairly short. Um, I, Before I got into the security field, I've been working with um, several different high-tech companies. I also worked, I was a consultant. <clears throat> I worked with um, a venture capital firm. Uh, so I had a lot of the finance background, I guess, and then I had some operational experience that I brought to the table. And this is, we're talking back 2000. Right after 9-11, actually, is when I got into the industry. And my other company I was working at at the time actually went went under, as other companies did around that time. So it was, it was a little bit of a um, challenging market, so to speak, especially in the field that I was had been operating within. And I did come across this company that uh, wasn't doing very well. And I was talking to the um, principal of that company. And one thing led to another, and... Um, I kind of offered him to, I, I guess I offered him to to to, um, to do a turnaround on that company at a kind of a no cost for him and some equity for me. And I did. So that company had about, at the time, they had about 10 employees. Um, and when I left that company, they had about uh, 1,000 employees. Mm. So we, I, under my leadership, we... Um, we were also San Francisco based, but we we had offices from Seattle down to um, San Diego actually at the time when I left. So we, they they have at the time they had a little bit bigger footprint that we have currently, but we're catching up and we're getting there as well. So, but yeah, that's how I got into it. And uh, twenty three years later, I guess I'm still at it. So, yeah. um, but it was it was it was fine. I mean, they, 
the first the first go around, I learned a lot, um, and I took a lot of the, I, I took the positive things from that company, turned it into ProGuard, and then I you know try to stay away from the things that didn't work so well from the other company because there's always things that work well and things that work less well when you're building a company and. Uh, so I took that experience, and and I think that we hit the mark with ProGuard um, several times, and we continue doing that. So good experience that I brought into the field. And then obviously I've been able to capture and, and recruit people like JJ to help me build that um uh, build the vision that I had from the beginning. That's right where I was going to go next. Tell me how the two of you got connected and, and JJ, what made you want to become part of ProGuard Security? So I, um, I have a very background as well in just public safety in general um, for about 30 years. Um, you know, I was in the United States Marine Corps for a while while I was attending college. Um, I had a brief, um, about a decade long um, career in law enforcement. So when I came into uh, security in 2012, it was a natural kind of a, a shift for me, you know, scheduling portion, you know, it's, it's, it's very similar to law enforcement, but security driven. So I started off at a very large company and um, learned a lot of things there and, and kind of moved up the chain there and um, went to another company, to a large regional company uh, in the Bay Area to oversee a couple of branches. Again, kind of um, honed in on my, on my skill set, learned more and was approached by, by Niels on LinkedIn, you know, um, just as Random private mm-hmm. message from um, oh, Mr. Niels right. Whelan, and I'm like, who is this guy? And so I, I you know, we started to we started a dialogue, and um, we ultimately met up, and we started to talk about security, pro, uh, ProGuard's trajectory, and how I could be of benefit to him. And um, that's kind of where the, the rest relationship, is history, right? Correct. Yeah. Well, I wouldn't actually go that far. Rest is history. <laughs> well, I guess it's a good saying, but <clears throat> I do have to. We're definitely. A, different company size-wise today than when JJ joined. Um, so this was actually like back in 18. Mm-hmm. Uh, so he did take a fairly significant risk in a way, joining a smaller company at that time. But um, so uh, kudos to, to JJ and, and actually being able to recognize what I was just pretty much laying out on paper um, and taking it for the my word that this was going to happen. I mean, that's kind of one of the tougher things that you do. Um, you make these, you in your career, you come up on these different segments where you have a decision to make. And um, a lot of times you can look at the rearview mirror and go, hmm, maybe I didn't do the, the right decision here. Um, and, and that's really, really tough. It's a, t- it's a tough point where you get to that um, as a person. How do you make, how do you, decide which one is the best decision for you and your family when you make that. And I think that if I give myself a little bit of kudos here, um, I think that I was convincing enough and, and I could point it, paint a picture uh, well enough to what, I, what my vision was with the company. And I was trustworthy. I shouldn't say enough there, but I was trustworthy so that he actually believed what I was saying. So I think that is really yeah. what got us to where we are today. That's a, uh, that's a great point. It's something that, you know, I don't really often think about. And uh, I'm glad you brought that up. Yeah. It was a concern of mine. You know, I was married, I had children. And, um, but I think ultimately my reason for switching over is a testament to Niels and kind of his vision for the company and where he saw us going trajectory wise in the future. And I was felt safe enough that um, we were going to accomplish things that we set out to do and we, and we have. Um, So we we are a success story, but we are just continuing to, you know, get better and, and better and protect people and places, yeah. you know, for, for, for our clients. So ProGuard has been around for 20 years. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so you've been at this for a while. From your extensive experience, both of you, what are the biggest challenges that you see currently happening in the security industry? And I think you spoke a little bit about yeah. some of these vacancies and things. Is there Are there more concerns? Yeah, well, I mean, there are... <sighs> You lay. You, you got to look at. I mean, the industry in a, as a whole. You look at it, but then you also you you got to carve out how different things kind of fit in with each other. Okay, so we have labor market, and that's one mm-hmm. thing. Uh, how do you how do you attract and how do you connect and how do you keep good employees? Uh, that's one aspect, and that's been challenging in some markets, and it's been less challenging in other markets. It's just, I mean, labor market is is not necessarily a to some extent, it's 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 similar nationwide, but then there are pockets that are more uh, have more unemployment than others. So, you have 
maybe more of a challenge in the Bay Area hiring than you have in Phoenix or versus LA. So, but those are things that we monitor on a regular basis. And we, we just, as a group, come together and decide how we're going to continue attracting good people. And um, so that's one aspect of, of challenges that we have. And then there's legislative uh, challenges that we're up against sometimes. They, California, some people might have heard uh, rumors about, they do change uh, their their climate for businesses here and there. And sometimes it's not always to the better for us. Uh, it can be challenging to operate in, in California. Uh, there is no doubt about that. I have been doing that for 20 plus years, but yeah, it's, it's, it, it can be challenging. So you, you, you have to adapt to those things as well um, and address those as they come up and make sure that you protect the company for uh, different liabilities that might be hidden in a way. Um, and then obviously we look at clients and, and the challenges they have. Where is our, where is our markets going? Um, we touched upon it before the commercial space has, has been challenged. In, in the Class A buildings, we, we know that the, I mean, you can just open any <laughs> newspaper and read about transaction that's selling at lower cost than they bought them for before COVID. So those are challenges that we, doesn't necessarily prevent us from providing services, but it's things that we need to be aware of on a regular basis uh, and adapt to. But it's part of kind of building a business. You just have to be in tune with it. So I'll, I'll let JJ add a little bit to it there before. Yeah, I'd love to piggyback off of that. Um, in terms of keeping up with the market, um, you know, there's laws passed, such as in California. Um, there was a law passed in April that um, states any, you know, large fast food chain um, establishment has to pay their, their employees at least $20 an hour. So that's, that's significant for us, right, uh, being in the security market. So the, the good thing about our company is that, you know, we vet our clients as much as they vet us. And so when the time comes, we can go to them and have an honest conversation with them and go, listen, this new law passed is going to make recruiting a little bit more difficult. We need to, you know, keep that delta between what security officers are being paid and what fast food workers are being paid. So we're going to, you know, let's discuss, you know, maybe getting a rate increase and, and giving the officers a, uh, a wage increase and things like that. And most of the time, our clients are um, appreciative of the fact that we're able to have these, like, very transparent conversations with them. And it you know, kind of goes back to why we selected to work with them in the first place. Another aspect I think that's, that's challenging as well is the security industry itself. You have you know, four or five major players that are multi-billion dollar companies. And a lot of those companies have an acquisition type of model where they go and instead of growing organically, they acquire smaller companies and add headcount to, to their line staff. And so if you're a client, you basically can pick out of three. Right? You can pick one of the huge companies. There's a lot of regulation. There's a lot of red tape, if you will. And they have a kind of a security in a box kind of formula for you where they'll just give you, you know, um, officers, regardless of whether they're a fit for your site or not. Or you can pick from a very small company that's probably been small for the last 20 years and they never grew because they were just kind of comfortable where they're at. The challenge with those companies is that they don't have the the, the technology, you know, and, and, the, and the innovation spirit to really grow. So they kind of, they're stagnant. They kind of stay where they're at. And uh, those companies have a very difficult time attracting and, you know, um, keeping client, um, you know, officers as well. Whereas we fit kind of like right in the middle of that. And we, you know, we're consider ourselves a large regional player. Uh, we're not nationwide right now. We're just obviously in two states. But, you know, our motto is we're, we're big enough to handle a very large account, but we're still small enough to care and, and be able to respond to our clients respond to our officers and have that engagement that is missing, um, quite frankly, from some of the larger competitors. So the security industry has about, in the U.S., uh, there are about, there's close to 8,000 security companies. 7,800 of those security companies have a revenue less than $5 million hmm. or in that bucket that JJ just talked about. And they've been there for a long time. If you, And if you, if you really do a deep dive into those companies, they... They have a structure where you kind of, if they get a larger account, they they don't really have the manpower to to staff it and manage it. So then they they might bump up to seven million for a while, and then they will drop down again. So the majority of all the companies in the U.S. has less than five million dollars in revenue. Then you have three or four, top of my head now, actually I think it's three or four that are in the billion dollar class. Maybe there's a fifth one as well. 
But then, yeah, three or four up there in the billion dollar, multinational, you know, they're in international companies. Exactly. So then uh, what, what JJ say, those are two buckets that you can pick from. Then there is about 15 to 25 companies, say 20 to 25 companies that are about the same size as we are. Uh, and they're spread out uh, throughout the U.S. So when you look at a region like California, Phoenix, Arizona area, Nevada, we're also licensed there. Don't have any operation there yet, but there are not that many options uh, for the the, uh, the clients um, to, to pick from that are sizable enough uh, to actually handle your business. The one thing I think has helped us <clears throat> quite a bit in our approach to security is that I didn't come from security in the first place. Uh, so I think I've taken a completely different approach to security than a lot of other security companies have, meaning that we have did, done things in a way that uh, is... A, is unique. Uh, and I think uniqueness is what can actually set you apart. If you're doing it exactly what everybody else is doing, it's going to be really hard to distinguish yourself and, and create a competitive advantage. Leadership, you, should, you can never underestimate uh, the leadership in a, in a company like ours. Uh, and it's, it's like on all levels. Um, and if we don't speak the same language, um, then we will not be able to execute on our uh, vision and mission. And I give that I give I give kudos to everybody in, in, in management and leadership to that we are working really on the same platform with the same goals and we speak the same language. So I mean we're a very mission driven organization and everybody understands the mission, which is I think is very important. So that's really part of what our success is based on. So many nuggets that you've shared leads me to additional questions. So I'm sure. trying to decide where to go next. <laughs> uh, I want to come back to leadership principles here in a moment and how that relates to the security industry. Before I do that, though, let's talk a little bit about how you build and motivate your workforce. Like, how do you, with such ambitious goals here for Arizona specifically, how do you keep folks motivated and staying on board with you? It's a good question. And I think the, you know, your culture. Is, is, is going to do that. Um, if you have a culture that's, you know, fast-paced, exciting of the times, you're going to get a lot of buy-in from people. Um, but the main thing is to stay engaged with your employees. And, you know, having worked at some of the other companies, larger companies, you know, you get hired on one day, and the next day you're on a site working by yourself, and you've had no training, no engagement. Um, you're trying to get a raincoat because it's raining and it takes, you know, three months to get a hold of your operations manager to get one. I've experienced those things. Mm -hmm. um, for us, that's, that's a no-go. You know, that cannot happen. Um, if an officer needs a raincoat, it needs to be happened that day. And we have the management and the, you know, uh, the responsibility to, to make that happen for them. And then they do that. So that's a really important aspect. And, you know, just, again, staying engaged, giving them incentives. Uh, you know, we have Employee of the Month awards and things like that. We want to recognize our officers. Um, the last two years, we've had officers be recognized and be giving uh, be given the uh, the Medal of Valor for you know certain life saving techniques and 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 things like that through uh, Cal Saga. There was only a couple of security companies that nominated people. Oh, that's it cool. was us and another company, and it's like mm -hmm. why are more people not doing that, not recognizing their officers? You know, they get paid to go down to Palm Springs and, and you know be awarded in front of people and be recognized for the work that they do. So I think that if you're a company that is engaged like that and you truly you know, show them that you value them. And, and if they want to make this a career, you're behind them, then, you know, you're, you're in a good place. And what a unique role for that security officer, because you're employed by ProGuard Security, mm -hmm. and yet you're on site with a different company. So I would imagine you could feel like you work in a silo if you're not welcomed and really um, acknowledged and appreciated by really both teams. All right. It, it, you're, it's it's very true what you're saying, and and that is a, that is an ongoing concern if you don't engage with your employees. I mean, nobody wants to work for somebody who's never present or doesn't give you any support. My role um, is to support my team. My role is not to have my team support me, and I am adamant about that. If you cannot 
you, you have to give support. You're there. You're not there just to dictate. You're there to support your people. So you're you're a resource for your people. And if you miss that mark, then it's going to be hard to motivate those people. Of course, I expect my managers and leaders to provide me with information as well, but it's kind of part of their, their jobs. But I am primarily there to be the support for them to be able to do their jobs. Leadership and so on, and provide them a vision and, and guidance and, and, and um, training if so needed. And I really want that and it, it, to, to, to trickle down all the way to the security officer level. Um, yes, the security officer have their assignments, but we are there, our managers, our field supervisors, our branch managers, account managers, they're all there to support the, the, the security officer. Because at the end of the day, the security officer is the one who is really delivering the service. As a joint effort, clearly, but he or she is on site with the clients. And so he or she is the face to our clients. Mm -hmm. Hugely important. Industry-wide, does it tend to be have a high turnover rate for, yeah? Yes, it's uh, it's known that, you know, some of the, some other companies have, you know, several, you know, anywhere from 100 to 300, 400 percent turnover in one year. Oh, wow. Um, you know, that means for every one officer, you're, you know, um, one position, you're turning it over for, you know, four times, three, four times. Um, we have a, a pretty low turnover rate. It's one of the things that we um, kind of pat ourselves on the back on. And we're able to put those things in our proposals for security and really stand behind it. Um, we're in the, you know, sub sub 30s percent uh, in terms of turnover. So Fantastic. It's, it is it is pretty good. And it's been like that for, you know, the entire time I've been here, which is almost six years now. Especially right. when you talk about competitive rate of pay and co comfortable working conditions, feeling part of the team, both the team that you're on or, and the site that they're at. I think that's fantastic. Let's talk mm -hmm. a little bit more about client relationships. Talked around it a little bit. Let me make sure that I haven't missed anything. Is there anything else that you do consciously and consistently to make sure that you offer the highest level of service with these clients? I mean, really, you, you have to be in relate. You spoke about how, you, how often you stay in touch with them. What else is in place? What do you hear a client say to you and you think, yes, this is why we do what we do? Right. So um, good question. Uh, the, 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 let me peel back a little bit on that question first before I go into really answering that question. First of all, from a client's perspective, it's very important that you understand who you're getting in bed with business, doing business with. Unfortunately, the industry isn't always clean, meaning that there are there are companies out there that are maybe not even licensed. There are companies out there that are not following uh, good business practices. So it's very important from from you, your client's perspective that you you pick a reputable company that's been around for a while. A lot, of course, a lot of clients look at the Bottom line, what's the cost? What's the security going to cost me? Because security is a expensive line item usually. And I understand the client wants to save some money here and so on. But when you, if you're not picking a client, uh, picking a company that's reputable and has been around and is known for providing a good service, you might end up paying for a service that's not really a service. And it might actually open you up for more liability than removing it. So that's a very important component. So when when a client goes out there and are picking your security vendor, be very aware of the fact that that they, there needs to be a reputable company behind it. So then the question goes into what you're talking about and what do we do different? How do you become a reputable company? I mean, obviously, get licensed first. Uh, that's the first part. Uh, you really need to be licensed. But then you need to build a company that has a structure, that, has, that you can actually control. And that, that is one of the things that we do. In, and I'm coming... I'm a more of an engineer. I did. I, first, I started engineering. That's what my daddy wanted. But then I switched over to um, finance. And so I became more of a finance guy. But my background is an engineer. My mindset is very, <laughs> it, it's more an engineering mindset, I guess, where you like, you, you come up with solutions and you come up with processes and so on. So that has really been the focus for, for, for ProGuard, where we develop these processes, we implement them. And then we steer the company in that to, to, to deliver service in accordance with the process. The process is always designed to, to give the client the best service available. And then when we hit that, we, 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 hit, the, we hit the marks. We, we, it's like putting a roadmap in place. And then we can work on that roadmap. And we can, we can tweak it. We get numbers back. And we say, okay, well, this was not 100%. How do we get it to 100%? So 
What do we do different? That is really kind of one of the core things that we do differently. We, we, we have these solid processes, and then we have follow-up measurements to measure how that process was followed or how, how well it played out. So, Yeah, I would add that, um, again, going back to transparency, I know I talked about it previously. You know, we're of the mindset, I've always been of the mindset that when I'm talking to a, a new client, prospective new client, and they want to know what we're all about, I'll tell them flat out, you know, I would rather turn you down right now than let you down three months from now. And that goes to everything that we do, and it, it includes even pricing. You know, we're not going to be the, the cheapest company ever because we understand that to have a, um, a solution that works, that, you know, satisfies everyone, it starts with the wage of the officer. That from there, it starts, you know, you're not going to be able to get good, good applicants, you know, recruit well if you don't have a, you know, a competitive wage. So we often go and, and speak with people and they go, well, you know, in San Francisco, for example, they'll go, oh, I'm paying my officers $20 an hour and, you know, I need to maybe have a cost savings because, you know, we have low tenancy here. That's probably not going to work for us because we're going to want to bring those officers at $25 an hour because that's the going rate right now in San Francisco for a security officer. So same thing, conversely, here in Phoenix. You know, you got to be at like $21, $22 an hour right now. And if you go online, you'll see security companies hiring at $16, $17. That's just not doable. So, again, being transparent and letting them know if you want something good, you're going to have to pay for it. Mm -hmm. You're going to have to pay to play, but we will give you good results. And I think that's you know, speaks volumes on why our client retention has been so high the time that I've been here. It's very high. We rarely lose clients. And conversely, we're probably not as big as we could be because we have turned down some... You're choosy. Some, yeah, we're choosy. Yeah, because we, we just know that at the end of the day, like Neil said, so what if we gained $5 million more in revenue if we're just going to lose it, you know, in six months from now? What's the point of that? All it does is just tarnish our reputation and, you know, it doesn't set a good standard for us. So that's one of the other... And, and it's wearing people out. And, you know, who wants to be on the losing team? It's... It, morale is... Morale is hugely important for a business. If you have a raw, raw win kind of attitude, then that's it will lead to win. Um, I mean, I, I am I'm, I'm a firm believer that if you if you uh, picture it, it's going to happen. If you mentally prepare yourself for something to happen, positive or negative, you you can make your mind bend the corner or or make the mind bend the 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 spoon. You can. Not physically, but you know. <laughs> oh, pretty, pretty close. <laughs> yeah. So, um, uh, so yeah, mentality and, and attitude is hugely important. And uh, even even just when you're recruiting somebody or sitting having a conversation, if you're going to be a positive and giving out positive attitudes and, and positive um, personality, then that person that you're interviewing is more likely to join your team than if you're giving off some negative vibes. So. What other leadership principles do you believe are important in the security industry? You've Ask thought... him. <laughs> yeah? My, my biggest thing always has been, you know, you can talk words, you can talk about ethics, integrity, accountability, things like that. But for me, it's always been, you know, you lead from the front. I've always found that if you're going to expect something from someone, you're going to train a security officer to do a job. You need to show them how to do the job if they don't know. And you need to ensure that they um, have grasped what you have taught them. And that's, you do that by, by testing them to ensure that they have grasped the thing. So for me, I'm never the type of person that likes to say, hey, do this. Um, you know, if you have some issues, you know, come to me, but just get it done. You know, I would rather, um, you know, be proactive, be democratic and show them, you know, what I expect, how I expect it to be done and be there for them to support them during, during that entire process. We've scratched around the topic around you being in two states right now, California and Arizona. What is the growth plan first here in Arizona, say, over the next six months to a year? And then I'd love to hear really what is the plan, if you know it, which I know, Niels, you do. <laughs> what what is is it beyond Arizona after that? Next six months, yeah, we have uh, – so we, I think we, we're in a very good spot right now where we put the – uh, groundwork for a very nice six to 12 months kind of growth project trajectory in, in the Phoenix area. Uh, we have some um, really solid clients that we started working with, and we're going to continue expanding on those uh, relationships. Some of them are in the HOA area, some of them are commercial, and we are building out the market that we, in the same way as we built out the market when we established ourselves in, in the previous market, San Francisco, Oakland, San Jose. So there's no real difference how we're doing it. We have done it. 
And we're going to continue doing it in the same way. As JJ said, um, we're selective uh, as it comes down to picking clients. But we're not, we're selected to the point where we know that we can, uh, that, that, that it's a fit between our service offering and their service interest. I, I always, if, if a client is interested in service, in, in the security service, if they know that they need security services, then that's a good client. If they feel that they, they, it's a must, uh, but it's not really a priority for them, then that's not going to be a good client for us because they are just, most of those clients are going to be looking primarily on the bottom line mm -hmm. um, or the cost structure. Beyond Phoenix, um, I mean, the LA office is also uh, coming around and, and growing at this point, and that's in the same state. The, the next state is kind of up in the air. It's between, I mean, we are, as I mentioned before, it's Nevada, but um, Washington is a growing market as well. Seattle is a very interesting market in our opinion. For, primarily, we're looking at the tier one market, and we're going to continue focus on those markets. Mm -hmm. so. Hmm. so, okay, with that in mind, how silly that I didn't think of this. This is a B2B radio, right, mm -hmm. and, and podcast production studio. Yes. So we have the opportunity to work with a lot of businesses here, specifically in Arizona, since most of our conversations are in person. <laughs> with that in mind, who are great introductions for you? Who are you looking to connect with so that you can continue to grow and uh, keep Arizona businesses and communities safe? Uh, the target audience and our demographic of, of who we do business with, commercial real estate professionals, facilities managers, engineers of, of maybe, you know, um, standalone companies, procurement officers. We do a lot of networking to, to get there. For example, we're um, a member of numerous BOMA associations, and BOMA stands for Building Owners and Managers Association. So it's really kind of some, uh, summarizes the, the commercial real estate and, and all the vendors that are in that market. We actually had an event yesterday for Phoenix BOMA. It was a very good turnout. We're also uh, members of the um, uh, Arizona Association of Commercial Managers, which is all uh, basically residential. And we're also in California doing that as well with the California Association of Commercial Managers. Um, so we're getting into the right you know, uh, vertical markets, if you will, and, and, the, and the key stakeholders in those markets that can make decisions in terms of, um, you know, getting security services from us. And on top of that, we kind of go outside of the box a little bit. And I want to give a, a shout out to um, Sandra Sabatini, our uh, business development manager here in Arizona. But she has forged some relationships with uh, some of some companies that you wouldn't normally expect. For example, we're a part of the Arizona Self Storage Association. Mm. Uh, so with that, we get, you know, access to talk to 500 self-storage owners in terms of, you know, what kind of security do you need? Do you want us to do patrols for you or, or monitor ca your cameras and things like that? So you have to think outside of the box and target that demographic of what you want your, um, ultimately your clients to be. Right. Yeah. Property managers, facility managers, there's a long list of, you know, within the HOA or in the commercial, there's a long list of different clients we want to uh, connect with. The, the way we do it is primarily to really, so, so, Getting your security contract or becoming your security vendor, I should say, is a matter of trust. Uh, you need to develop a relationship where your clients have comfort level with you, or the, where they trust you, because they are giving you the keys to the kingdom. I mean, that's you're there to provide a service to protect the assets, whatever they, that asset might be. So one of the ways we really, and, and JJ touched upon this, the one, one of the ways we, we establish this relationship is really by being involved in the community, being involved in these organizations. It might be, well, my, I, I can't remember all the different acronyms that, that are, are out there, but there, there are different industry organizations that bring property managers together, either if it's in the commercial space or if it's in, in the residential space and all kinds of different uh, industry associations that work with our core uh, clients we're interested in supporting. And we come in, we become members, we become sponsors, and we really get to know the people behind uh, these different companies, and they primarily get to know us as well. It's a process. It takes time. Uh, it's not something you do over one cup of coffee or one, one uh, booth event. It's an investment that you're making. And you're making that over time, and we are making that investment right now. I've heard consistently both of you talk about relationships. This is about building relationships, and when yep. relationships are built on trust, that 
doesn't necessarily happen right in the first conversation. It, <laughs> it has to be built over time. And the fact that you're getting involved in the community through sponsorships and being involved in these associations and organizations and saying, hey, we believe in your mission and purpose and bring these professionals together, I would imagine that then people in turn obviously want to get to know you better and find out how they can utilize your services and sing your praises elsewhere. So that's fantastic. What can we expect maybe the next five years with security overall? Like, do you see the landscape of security changing? And if so, what do you anticipate we're going to be experiencing? It is changing as everything else is changing. I don't think that necessarily it's um, in anything is static. Um, I think that we, the world around us is always evolving to some, to some extent. There are different technologies out there. Uh, there are some companies that are providing robotic services and they are in some way replacing or trying to replace security officers. Uh, it's it's still early in the game where you actually can replace a physical person. Um, there, there are so many aspects that goes into what our security officers are doing on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, I mean, everything from sitting in front of a desk and, 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 uh, or sitting behind a desk and, and greeting people, checking them in and so on. Sure, there are elements that you can remove. You can have a kiosk, you can check in, you can get access to a building and so on. And is it coming? Yes, it's coming, but you still have an element of a human touch. Uh, so is the industry con going to continue growing? In my opinion, yes. Right now, the, the technologies that are being developed uh, and being implemented, and we do that as well, uh, is more of a support function or augmenting your services. You're, you're adding a layer of security. You're not necessarily removing a cost. Sometimes you can do that, um, like with, with our remote monitoring. But it means that you will have to remove the person that was on the site. Let's say that we're doing a 168 that's a lingo for 24-7 services, 24-7 security services throughout the day. Okay, so now you have a decision. You can say, well, we don't really need the night guy. Okay, so you can remove them 56 hours. Uh, Sunday to uh, Saturday, you remove eight hours of work. That's 56 hours. Now you're going to take that cost of, say, you know, billing that out at $30 an hour, $35 an hour, and you can t take that remotely. But then you don't have a person there. So there, there's trade-offs. Yes, you're saving money, but you don't have a person there. So that's a business decision. And some people are making that decision. Yes, we need to save that money. We don't need that level of service. So, so that would be kind of what we touched upon before, that we, we want to work with our clients to help them be successful and have the right security solution for them here um, today and, and in the future. But, yeah, there will be changes. Yeah. I agree. Um, that's definitely, to me, in my opinion, the biggest thing, just integration of, you know, physical security, cybersecurity, uh, surveillance, and video security. And I think that, you know, if you augment all those, you do get a good security solution. Um, like Neil stated, uh, if you implement remote monitoring, you know, as a client, you're going to go from paying $30 an hour for a person to stand there or do patrols, you know, um, to pay maybe $8 an hour to have all your cameras monitored. So it's a cost savings for them. Actually, it's $9 an hour. $9, nine hours an hour. That's yeah. right. It's nine. <laughs> um, so it's a cost savings for them. You know, for us, sure, we lose some revenue, but maybe the profit margins are a little better for the, for the company. Right. So mm -hmm. that it, it makes up for that. Um, but at the same time, I think the most important thing is we're partnering with our client to meet their needs um, and give them something that's more cost effective, but still a very good solution that works for us and them. So recently, about a month or so ago, we had a security event uh, up in, uh, in, in Walnut Creek and um, outside of San Francisco or yeah, in the Bay Area. We brought together, it was us and it was three other companies. We did a smaller uh, security seminar conference um, yeah. and it was really focused on the ecosystem for security how does all the different companies kind of tie in between each other and it was everything from insurance to physical security and we have some technology companies in between and it's a very it was a great event very appreciated and and you know the the, the risks were addressed by the insurance companies or the insurance company and they were talking about buildings that don't have any uh, tenants and the risk about that and, and all the way up to how the uh, how, how liability is spread between 
how, how, how the different companies actually are facing increased liability, even though they have less of a revenue and so on. So that was a very interesting uh, conversation with, to be had with all these different uh, players within the industry. Uh, some were, some were um, technology providers and how they all tie together. So I think that continue building on that system that we have, the ecosystem for security is a, is a great way into the future and how we can, not just the physical side uh, or the, the security officer side, but how we can work together with, with the rest of the security providers in the industry to really build a cohesive and um, security solution that covers all your aspects of, of your assets. So, I want to go back to something that I thought of as you're both chatting. My other office is near the airport, Sky Harbor Airport, and it's a 10-story building. I own my own business, so I rent a, a space. So I'm one of many businesses in this large office. And I've never thought about it until today uh, that when we enter the, the business, the double doors before the elevators, there's a security desk there. And there's one security guard, probably out of seven, that I can kind of think in my mind that knows me by name, opens the door for me. Sometimes I've had to park in visitor parking because so I forgot my key fob or those things. He's always accommodating. And I don't even know who the security company is. I know it's not you guys. I know that much. Uh, there's something to be said for that personal touch, that high touch, and his, his companions, his teammates. And oftentimes there's two of them sitting there, maybe at shift change or whatever. He's one consistent person who I feel as a female business owner, oftentimes leaving late at night, getting there early in the morning, I feel safe when he's there. Mm -hmm. Can you? I don't, I don't know why I'm sharing that out loud other than you had me thinking about it when we're really talking about the human component of safety and security. I would argue with you that that gentleman or lady that does that, uh, is probably being compensated well, probably been there for a while, is taking ownership of, of the asset of the property, has a very good attitude, just is a doer, likes to you know do for others uh, and be of, of service, and probably feels valued by his company and uh, perhaps the client, you know, who's the the uh, property manager of the of the building, and just really loves you know his or her job, and that's why they do it to the best of their ability. So, what we want is seven of those people, right? And um, the way you do that is, again, all the things that I just mentioned, you know, you make them feel like they're part of an organization, that they're valued and that they're being looked after um, as a human being. And really, we want them to do well. And I, Real quick, if you before you do, Niels, uh, for me, it's the same security company, right? So I notice as a business owner, when I walk in there, I'm excited when I see them. It's a small thing. I've never literally, literally thought about it before in this conversation, before this conversation. I feel great when I see them. I feel safe. I feel welcomed. I feel like we're, we're partners in that building together. Mm -hmm. And he's on a team of several other people because oftentimes there are other people there. So while I Totally agree and appreciate what you're saying about this individual. Clearly, and I agree, I think he's been there a long time. There's something to be said about um, helping your team know, and clearly this is what I hear you guys do, helping them look at their roles from our perspective, from, from our lens, right? So that it feels consistent that if it is ProGuard, in this example, it's not, but if it is ProGuard security services that I can count on as a business owner, the same level of service, you know, with every single person that's there. We're not here to argue with you, JJ, but I, I'm not going to agree with one thing he said. I don't think that that person is compensated differently than the other. I think that that person just have a different attitude. And that is really what we try to either find or develop. Because there's due to those two things. And then he might be getting more, but I don't think that is why he's acting the way he's acting. I, I just think that is a, you, you can instill a value you can in, in people saying all the other things that JJ said, I completely agree with it. But you have, to, you have to instill a value. You have to tell the person that, you know what, this is what you're doing is very, very important. It's appreciated. It's, it, it's if you're not sharing the good feedback with your uh, officers, how you expect them to actually do that. This person is probably just a very, he, he's, he's, he's a person who has a positive attitude to start with. And to I, JJ's point, you want all of those on your of team. Of course. <laughs> and you, you can get people positive. They, I, I do believe that everybody wants to be positive and wants to have a positive outlook. I don't think necessarily people want to go around and be grumpy or 
And I do think that if you explain it in a way that they understand it, mm-hmm. they will try to do the best they can. I mean, I've, I'm sure a lot of people have heard this before, but my dad told me when I was younger, well, you, you have two choices. You can do it sloppy or you can do it with a smile on your face. And if you do it sloppy, you're not going to feel better about it. If you do it with a smile on your face, you're going to feel good about it. You really you are. It comes back to attitude again, as I said before. And mm-hmm. we want to share a positive attitude with our employees to make sure that they are feeling the same thing. And I think that, you know, again, speaking about turnover, you know, we have low turnover, but the industry is riddled with high turnover. And you mentioned that, you know, he's probably been there for a long time. So, you know, years and years of that person learning, you know, the, the different um, business owners, knowing them by their name, you know, that comes with time. So if you're a company that operates off of, oh, okay, this person didn't work out, let's just throw another person there, you're not going to get that no. because, you know, unless the person is really exceptional, it takes time for that. So oh. retention is very important. Agreed. We are almost at the top of the hour. Is there anything that I hadn't thought to ask or something that you want to expand on before we close that you really want our listeners and viewers to know about ProGuard Security Services? When is our next upcoming event that we're sponsoring, JJ, mm. here in Phoenix? Oh, you can so come, and, come and visit us at the next event. Yes. I cannot recall off the <laughs> top of my head. But, okay. Um, well, I don't want to put you on the spot. We have many, many events. Follow us on, uh, on LinkedIn, ProGuard Security Services. Uh, you will see all of our, you know, marketing posts and how we, you know, appreciate our employees and, and our clients and the various things that we do. Uh, we also have a Facebook page, um, ProGuardSecurityServices.com is our website. Uh, very interactive. You can go in there and see kind of what we're about. Um, you know, book a consultation. I was just going to ask, what is the first step if somebody's listening and, and watching today and they're like, okay, yeah, we're ready to make a change or, you know, we're just starting off. It's just a consultation. That's where you start? Easiest way would be to go to our website and fill out the, you know, uh, the form that mm-hmm. says basically I'm interested in security services and then somebody will get back to you ASAP because right. uh, we don't let those things linger. And you'll speak with a security professional who, who can, you know, talk our talk, talk about what ProGuard is, who ProGuard is, and, um, you know, get those talks in their way so that we can potentially partner with them. Mm-hmm. Or, or just call JJ you just call right, directly, right yeah. away. What's your phone number, JJ? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, give us that cell number. No. Yeah. <laughs> I am the fortunate recipient of a challenge coin that JJ gave me when you walked in here today, which is great because we've gotten to know each other, all three of us, uh, over the course of a couple months. So thank you for this lovely gift. I mentioned when you handed it to me that out of the seven years and probably 2,000 podcasts that we've had come through the studio, I only have five challenge coins, uh, you know, not not this one, but similar. So thank you for the very thoughtful gift. Tell us a little bit about the challenge coin if you can and, and who is it? typically for besides, you know, great radio hosts and studio owners? Right. <laughs> or is it just for us? The, yes. cha- the challenge coin, you know, I, I was introduced at first when I was in the United States Marine Corps yes. and then in law enforcement as well. And I've seen it in security as well. I'm not, you know, professional on how it came about, but in doing some research on it, you know, it dates back to the Roman times. But it's really, a, you know, started in, I think, around World War One, and it's a military thing, really. Um, it shows your allegiance to your group. If you're a part of a certain... Um, you know, artillery company or something like that, then that it would, it would, it would show your allegiance to them. Um, it does make a good present to give, you know, other people. And the most notable thing that people will tell you is that if you're in possession of a challenge coin and say you're having, you know, some sort of an industry mixer, happy hour or something like that, if you come up and you're amongst colleagues and you slam down your challenge coin, the other people better put, put theirs, theirs down too. as well. Yeah, and whoever's last to put it down has to buy a round. Has to buy the first round or whomever doesn't even have one, then they're responsible for buying a round. So that's that's the old. That's the main thing that I need this for. Right. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. The first two uh, challenge coins that I received were from the um, ESGR, the Employee Service Guard and Reserve Employment advocates on behalf of our service members who have to leave their employment, right, and and go on on reserve. And I um, was able to produce their show for, I think, almost three years. And they awarded me with a Seven Seals Award, uh, which is just outside the studio, and a couple of challenge coins. I had forgotten that it really was based in that that beautiful military culture. So thank you for that remembrance and for the gift. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so one more time, we can follow uh, ProGuard Security Services on LinkedIn and the website again, please. 
ProGuardSecurityServices.com. All right. Well, thank you again for spending your afternoon with me. It's a pleasure to get to know both of you even better today and uh, look forward to our next conversation. Thank You've been you. listening to Phoenix Business Radio X, broadcasting live from the Max 6 Entrepreneur Center. Some media lean left, some lean right, and we lean security. Until next time, I'm Karen Nowicki. Thanks for listening. Mm-hmm.